Welcome to another exciting edition of Coffee, Beer, Coaching, and Dogs. Uh, today we're going to be talking with Michael Rosen. Uh, he wrote a book a while back, a couple of years ago, that got published called Open Water, The History and Technique of Swimming. Uh, Michael is a longtime swimmer, so Michael uh, grew up in Sweden, um, swam competitively there, uh, was recruited to swim in the United States, uh, and swam uh, in college here um, at uh, UNLV and uh, had, a, had a pretty good, pretty good um, four years at UNLV swimming, and then uh, he went back to Sweden and has been coaching, and he's, he's the uh, Swedish open water national coach. Uh, so he's, he's uh, participated um, either as an athlete or coach at uh, the international level, uh, working with um, really great athletes and coaches. And wrote a really terrific book about uh, kind of the history of open water swimming. So if you're interested in kind of the last hundred plus years of, of swimming, how it's developed, um, you know, Michael's done a really great job of assembling all of the information, all the history of, of our sport, and put it into a, a really accessible book and format. So I, I, I definitely uh, um, encourage you to check it out. He's also uh, participated, I think he's placed top 10 at uh, Otello events, so the swim run events in uh, in Sweden. So, um, yeah, so without kind of uh, further ado, um, well, we have a little bit of do to do, but um, we got to thank our sponsors also. But yeah, we'll, uh, the, after we thank our sponsors, we'll, we'll start the interview with Michael. So uh, the sponsors that uh, I would like to thank today are uh, Brian Padilla. Um, Aubrey Aldi of All Day Endurance, Matt Hansen Racing, uh, Magnolia Masters, Snapping Tortuga, and Swim Easy Speed. And then, as always, the ever-present assistant coach, Max. So um, we're always very thankful for our sponsors. We couldn't do this without them. And uh, in, in that light, uh, we are also putting out the latest Coffee, Beer, Coaching, Dogs t-shirt, the 2020-2021 edition. Um, I'll post a, uh, picture of it up on the swim easy speed, uh, YouTube channel. And if you guys are interested, I'll put a link in, um, uh, the bottom to, uh, to pick one up and, uh, or if you just want to reach out to me, you can get me at, uh, Tim at cbcdmedia.com. So it's Tim at cbcdmedia.com. Um, and we can get you squared away. But yeah, it's as always, it's a great t-shirt. Um, the t-shirts are fantastic themselves. I'm kind of fanatical about that. And then the, um, uh, the, the latest kind of logo design on the front is apropos for what we've all been going through for the last two plus years. So, um, yeah, so I got, I hope you guys uh, enjoy the podcast today. And if there are any questions, please let me know. Uh, but here is, uh, Michael Rosen. Welcome to another edition of Coffee, Beer, Coaching, and Dogs. Uh, today we've got, uh, I'm going to butcher the name in Swedish, but I will uh, then revert to uh, what his uh, name was when he was swimming at UNLV. So it's Mikael Rosien, I think in Swedish, I'm close enough, and then Mike Rosen in, uh, in kind of butchered uh, U.S. English. So, uh, Michael, welcome. Yeah, you did pretty good. Pretty okay. Good. Yeah. Well, you know. Good there we go. Case. There we go. Um. So, uh, you kind of you are the head coach of uh, Swedish open, Sweden Open Water. Uh, you've got a, a really long competitive swimming background. Um, for those kind of triathletes out there that are uh, interested in Otillo, um, you were kind of one of the pioneers racing in that, and you've placed uh, as high as sixth at Otillo, the Swim Run World Championships in Sweden. And then uh, you're also currently a coach of uh, 36 athletes between the age of 13 and 18 on, uh, is it Neptune is the name of the team? Yeah. Neptune is, is our team. Yep. Uh, it's kind of a big team with 5,000 uh, members. So yep. we have uh, spread out over five different sports. It's uh, swimming, water polo, diving, synchro, and open water. Okay. And and how many how many pools does that uh, you guys uh, take up then? It's a main pool, and then we have a minor activity in like five pools. Okay, all right. Um, and how long have you been uh, been working there? Uh, I fill in now for a guy who swam at uh, uh, 
he coached at Eastern Michigan and he swam in this in state just in shields. So okay. as many guys, he met a Swede and moved to Sweden. So yeah. now he's on paternity leave, which is kind of uncommon in uh, some parts of the States, I guess. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, SMU was where I swam, was always uh, big on pulling in uh, foreign athletes. And I think when I was there, there were, well, we talked about it, there were, what, uh, Gus and um, and Lars were uh, were swimming at SMU at the time. Yeah, they and did I, they're really good. Yeah, uh, and I think, so, yeah. I think there was, I want to say there was one female. There were three Danish girls that were on the team at the time. Too. But uh, yeah, no, it's um, yeah, no, SM or uh, NC2As, it seems, pulls from a lot of uh, or pulls more and more athletes from all over the world for swimming, it looks like. Yeah, I believe that's a, that's a big gift for world swimming. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because, uh, com- yeah, uh, for example, uh, the South African team that won the gold medals in um, the 4x100 yep. in uh, Athens. Yep. We had Roland and uh, Rake, they yep. swam at Arizona, and uh, yeah. So well, we I had, think uh, you can even go back uh, earlier than that. It was uh, 92 in the French team um, when they won, and uh, I think it was the 4x1. And they went through and they were interviewing them and they were like, where do you swim? Auburn. Where do you swim? Auburn. Where do you, and that was when uh, Dave Marsh was at uh, Auburn and Auburn was the, you know, that sprint powerhouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a lot of, lot of, uh, uh, sort of began, the first Swede went over to USC back in 1960, 61. Okay. Perula so, and he came back and swam at Europeans, and not many guys knew what a flip turn was. And in the 4x200 freestyle, 800 pre relay, he finished off the last, the, the homecoming with a flip turn. And that on TV, imagine, imagine. <laughs> the, first, like the first flip the first, turn, yeah. Yeah, the first four spirit flop or like a bob being on things. Yeah, yeah. It was really big in, in Sweden. Yep. Uh, and they won the... the and this is what, early, you said early 1960s? Yes. Okay. All right. Interesting. Um, so you've, how long have you been, um, the head coach of Sweden open water? Since, um, after Olympics, uh, 2012. Okay. They wanted to, uh, gain, uh, gain, gain some, uh, some levels in this new sport. Okay. We had the, we had the swimmer in, uh, 2008, but that was more like on an individual uh, she trained with Philippe Luca in uh, in France, and uh, uh, that's that's really hard. Uh, it's like if if, if we like if if you're gonna pull out a few of those coaches that has really really tough regiments, we have Mark Schubert. Yeah. <laughs> uh, See, I grew have, up. I grew up around Mission Viejo uh, in yeah, the 1980s. We have Lucas. And we have, uh, for example, another French. Uh, we have um, Axel Raymond's coach. It's a female, yep. Magali. Yep. She she has him swimming like 120, 130,000 meters a week. Yeah. And uh, yeah. that's not without. Uh, um, she has kind of high requirements on how it's going to perform that. So, yeah. No, I, I, I heard a, I actually heard a story one time, a coach that had been at Mission Viejo, um, kind of in the late seventies, early eighties when, you know, that program was, um, I mean, at the time was almost kind of like Mecca for swimming where it was, it was kind of the, where a lot of the, um, uh, big athletes were training and it seemed like everyone was that was winning gold medals or setting world records was kind of coming out of that program. Yeah. I remember a cover on, on the swimming world when they had like, uh, like eight or nine out of 10 latest championships. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so this coach told me the story about, um, that the Italian national champion in like the hundred meter breaststroke came in came in to train at Mission Viejo and she showed up on her first day 
And, um, you know, she's like, well, you know, uh, what, what lane am I in? You know, what, which lane am I going to be? Is the breaststroke lane? And, um, so they pointed to the, the lane she was going to be in. They said, and you're going to be going fifth in the lane. That's because the, the four fastest hundred meter breaststrokers in the world were also training in that lane. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, uh, more developed now when, with the uh, post, uh, college programs and, yeah. uh, it's sort of a good idea with uh, what, what um, Constantine is doing with the ISL. Yeah, uh, it, it's not that's not like a profit company, not yet, but it, it's uh, it's a lot worth for the post grad swimmers. Yeah, I know that. Um, I guess Dave Salo just left USC to kind of um, devote uh, full time to kind of his you know pro elite team. Yeah, and remember, uh, remember, remember, but uh, a part in history was uh, that um, some post-grads decided to train for uh, the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics. It was like Bill Barrett, Steve Lundquist, mm-hmm. and some, some guys that already, they, they, they like quit college in uh, 82 or 83. Yeah. And they were... 22, uh, 23, 24 yeah. years of age. And oh, and that was like, that was college. back then, that was ancient for swimmers. Yeah. They were calling that like the, the fossils mm-hmm. of swimming. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the one thing is that I've always noticed about you, because I followed your Instagram for a while, is that um, you enjoy kind of like traveling around to all the different uh, open water events and you're always talking with people and always interacting and um, have a really good sense of the history of swimming. So, um, can you, can you talk a little bit about your background in swimming and, and how you came into it and how you got to where you are now? Yeah. Okay. The core curriculum in Sweden is that every kid that's, uh, grade four or five is supposed to be able to swim 200 meters of uh, which uh, 25 meters is supposed to be on the back. Okay. So that, that's the core curi- curriculum. Now, do you mostly and have do you mostly have long course pools or are they short course meters pools in Sweden? Uh, short course meters. Um, yeah. They're mainly indoors. We have we're nine million people in uh, ten million people in in Sweden, and we have about fifteen indoor 50 meter pools. Okay. And the rest is. Uh, I think we have like uh, 200 uh, pools that's uh, 25 meters. Okay. Uh, and swimmable. And yeah, I was the only one in my, say, after second grade that couldn't make these requirements. <laughs> I couldn't make the core curriculum. Okay. So I, I had to go to summer school. Yep. And the summer of 82 in Sweden, like you're, you're, you're now based in Houston, but yeah. summer in Sweden can at times be like spring in Alaska or something. It's, okay. uh, it's kind of harsh. Yeah. So, and I know when I was 13, which was a few years later, I was, I was 6'3", mm-hmm. which is tall for being one of those guys. And I was about 110 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been uh, a good way of uh, I would have been cheap I, I would, have, would have been cheap for a college if I would have uh, yeah. college team, if I would have kept that because they could fax me to the yeah exactly to the me it's away uh, yeah, this is um, yeah but all our guys like 1986 I started swimming mm-hmm. after that, uh, after that summer school, and I was kind of slow. But uh, in na- 1986, a lot of bad things happened. In the U.S., uh, the Challenger, yeah, it crashed. Yep. Uh, in uh, the Soviet, Chernobyl mm-hmm. crashed, and in Sweden, Olof Palme, which was uh, he, he was our prime minister, he was shot and uh, killed, and in the summer, my pool 
in uh, my hometown, a little hometown, burnt down to the ground. And uh, yeah, and that was kind of big in my in your world. In my yeah, in yeah. my world. Yeah, yeah. So what did we do? Our parents on my little team they uh, commuted. So one time a week we had one lane, 40, 45 minutes away. Yep. And that was um, 13 swimmers in one, one short course meter lane. Mm -hmm. And then we had four lanes in, um, in the Saturdays. I think it was two, uh, two hours. So that was what we did. I played some hockey. Uh, and then uh, after that, I devoted to swimming. Okay. I think that was the, the winter I discovered uh, swimming world. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The, um, the American uh, periodical. Yep. That covered uh, swimming. Yes. Yeah, for yes. competitive swimmers. So in one way, I wasn't training much swimming that year when I was 12, 13. Mm -hmm. But I sort of worked mentally on swimming. Yeah. Which yeah. also is a part well, it's interesting that you said that, uh, you know, that you were kind of slow kind of starting out. Um, I, one of the guys that I swam with in, uh, in high school, uh, was Josh Davis. You know, you know, the name American. Yes, yes, yeah. I met Josh. yeah. Um, so I swam with Josh in, in high school and, um, he didn't start swimming until he was about 13. And, um, one of the coaches at the time, uh, he had actually been, uh, he had gotten a bronze medal in the 64 games in the 200 IM. That was Tokyo. And, um, he, uh, you know, told Josh and his parents, um, because Josh was swimming on the team and, uh, told Josh's parents, you know, uh, Josh really isn't that good. Um, he might want to find a different sport to do. And so Josh, I think, you know, really took that to heart and rededicated himself and, um, you know, went on to, uh, well, I mean, at one point he had the American record in the, the 200 free, 200 meter free. Yeah. And I also remember as well, I talked to him, uh, I think we had dinner together and, uh, it was the world cup in the college station yep. and, and, uh, I think he won four events in one final. Mm -hmm. Like in my, yeah, yeah, I think he swam the two hundred back. He swam the yeah, two hundred three. Uh, he's he won four events in one uh, in one session, and that was so uncommon for for the Europeans because they were used to my, maybe maximum one or two yeah. uh, per session. One one race and one relay. That's you know. Like, but uh, he was tough from the what they did with the Eddie and the yeah. The jewel mates. Yeah. Yep. No. He. Uh, yeah. It definitely. It definitely prepares you for. Uh, you know. You, you definitely create a little muscle memory there, or, or quote unquote a yeah, good yeah. a good base of training. Is this still coaching in Oklahoma? Uh, yeah, no, he's coaching. Uh, I think it's Oklahoma Christian University, or yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess he's building a program. Yeah, yeah he's trying yes. to build a program. Um, yes. So you wrote a book um, called "Open Water: The History and Technique of Swimming," and uh, I thought we'd uh, kind of discuss it a little bit, kick it around. Yeah, we can start a little bit with the, with the title. Uh, uh, like we, in, in Sweden, we had uh, mid, mid 90s, there were four races mm -hmm. and about 1500 swimmers doing those races. And mainly because of one of those races, which also is the main sponsor of the Sweden Open Water National Team, was Vans Prosimnio in Vansbury, Sweden. They have, uh, we had something we call the Swedish classic, which is uh, you're going to ski, yep. you're going to run, you're going to bike, and you're going to do the swimming in one year. Okay. And then you're a Swedish classic. So they kind of pull, uh, push, push and pull for each other. Yep. So a lot of guys want to do all those races. Okay. 
So um, uh, they had like 1,400 of that, those 1,500 swimmers. Um, like 10 years later, things happened. And how, how far were the open water swims? What were the distances? That was, that's a 3, 3K. Oh, okay, 3K. 3K. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the biking is uh, 300K, and the uh, running is 30K, and uh, the skiing is 90, 90K. So, like always, the swim gets the short end of the stick and, and the, the, yeah, the, yeah, the, the, the least amount. Is, uh, swimming is lethal if you can't do it yeah. properly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, but, but uh, this grew. Uh, we had, um, like in Sweden, a lot of guys converted from golf and tennis mm -hmm. to endurance sports. Yep. Uh, triathlon became like a household uh, because we had a, yeah, later on we had a Olympic, uh, uh, Olympic silver medalist, Lisa Nordian. Yep. And the Ironman came to Sweden. We had it in Swedish. It was, wasn't like a, a branded Ironman, but we had the event. Yep. very early in Sweden, like 93. Okay. So it gradually, so 10 years later, instead of uh, four races and uh, 1,500 swimmers, we it quadrupled. So we had like 60 races, 16 races, and we had like 6,000 swimmers. Wow. That's, that's a lot of great, that, yeah, that's great. Yeah. And that carried on for like mid, uh, like 2016, we had, more than than six four races and more than uh, sixteen thousand swimmers. Okay, so it quadrupled once again in a decade. So uh, and then in that period of time, Swimrun was uh, was founded and was like sort of on the rise. It's supposedly the uh, the sw Swimrun and UFC like mixed martial arts is yeah yeah I think it's the, the the steepest rising sports well I guess Sweden's kind of perfectly set up for it with the the little archipelago and the the just the yes, little island yeah. to island and island to island because yeah. how many you know, on the original one how many on the original course how many islands do you uh, swim running to yeah, we have uh, start on island one and then we pass 21 so it's on the 22nd island okay so it's, it's uh 21 swims and 22 islands okay involved yeah, yeah and what's the total distances again so total distance swim total distance run do you remember it's about 50 50 miles okay total uh, so it's it's uh, 65k running yep and uh, 10k swimming. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. that's uh, yeah. And with my friend uh, Richard, he was doing that race kind of early. And uh, in that uh, back then in 2006 and seven was a one person show. So mm -hmm. one guy, one team. But he. He has like poor vision, so he swam to the wrong island. So then they kept it like they made it like a <laughs> like a body race. So he's kind of the, one of those uh, guys who, who, who made it what it what it is. Yeah. So then then guy Richard, he's, he he was on the starting line uh, five years in a row. Okay. And uh, like he swam to the wrong island, and he. He sort of he sort of didn't succeed, uh, so it kind of uh, uh, yeah he he wasn't really some kind of he, he was he didn't even have glory days yeah so I did it with him he called called me and said yeah uh, do you know anyone who can do out there 2011 and I was thinking this was after. We tried to like raise, raise his uh, stocks in sports and. Uh, now, what kind of a, what kind of uh, swimmer were you? What were your events that you competed in? Yeah, I competed in the in the distance. Okay. So, so yeah, I swam the I swam the fifteen hundred and mile. Yep. In college, and I had so good teammates, so I won 
Swedish nationals in four by one hundred and four by two hundred. Okay. So, uh, I, I swam uh, with Lars Frölander. Yeah. He was the world record holder in hundred. Hundred fly. fly. Yep. Uh, and the it dated dated was, dated a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader for a while. He did. He did. Yeah. 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 Uh, now he's uh, he's soon getting his uh, second kid. Okay. Slow down a little, a little bit in Sweden. So, uh, yeah, and the Stefan Houston was also pretty good. He had 45 8 in the 100, 100 meter short course pre, and he was also a world record holder. Like, um, um, so, yeah, I, I was lucky uh, to swim with them. So, I, I, that was perfectly okay with my 51 or 52. So. Yeah, yeah. And, we held them all. So, yeah. Uh, and then uh, when I picked up, uh, I went to med school and uh, then I, then we had that, um, I sort of quit, quit uh, with swimming. Yep. For a couple of years, uh, went to med school and then we had that dissection. So we dissected people and I thought, yeah, I'm kind of smelling not so good here. So uh, I started swimming again yep. for, for the masters and because uh, the chlorine will, the chlorine will cover up any smell. Yes. Uh, so yeah, so it's kind of a new new wave of swimming and then uh, that content contained the, the, the uh, swim run and sort of coaching a bunch of triathletes. Yep. So, yeah, because I think you worked with uh, Patrick Nilsson for a while, didn't you? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, he's based in um, in Denmark, a Swede based in Denmark. Yeah. He, I, I can't tell from from where the, the, the swimmers I've seen working out, or uh, some guys have that little extra. Yeah. You can tell them to make a minor change. Yeah. And they're doing it. And they also have like a super immune um, defense. So um, they can regulate when they feel that, yeah, maybe that's not my day. I have something within my system. So then they back down a little bit, take a bit of um, um, active or non-active recovery, and then they just move on. Yep. So, and he's that guy. Um, so, but as for uh, running and, and, and triathlon, it's complicated. Oh, yeah, without a and doubt. The Ironman, the, the Ironman distance is so long. So, it's hard to practice what's going to happen with your body after seven and a half hours. Yeah, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Yeah, so his last, uh, Patrick's last uh, races, he had some cramps, and uh, it's kind of hard to to, to deal with um, before because you don't know how you react after after the bike. Yeah, no, and I mean, kind of my experience with working with triathletes, and particularly Ironman triathletes, has been that um, those that are looking to make gains in the swim. Um, and especially kind of like at the pro level where, you know, they want to swim at a, you know, at a certain relation to the front pack and the guys coming out of the water first, um, that the bike and run training typically builds up a level of fatigue in them that it makes it really difficult to make any kind of gain, any significant gains in the, in the swim that the first kind of, of the three legs that, that in training that kind of sees the fatigue or really kind of experiences the fatigue is the swim. Yes. That it's difficult yes. to, it's difficult to find the gains that they're looking for unless, you know, they get injured and they're not running anymore. And then you can, you know, take them and, and, and work them on the swim and then they make some gains and then they're, then they go back to running and it, it all just kind of goes to shit then. Yeah. Yeah. What he did was, uh, sort of, um, he trained like three, four times a week. Yeah. Uh, he didn't have really much of a plan. And uh, he, he worked on the other, the other events. He worked uh, with his wife on, uh, on the nutrition. He's yeah. a pro in nutrition. And uh, um, 
but uh, we start to work a little bit on the technique, uh, not too much because what works works. Yeah. And then we and, and then we uh, we change a little bit and then we turned on the heat a little bit on swimming. And uh, his wife was his coach for the, that time, and she she sort of sent a, a message so how hard and how much is Patrick going to swim? <laughs> I, I don't know if they were trying to conceive their kid at the moment, yeah. but, and he was too tired. But, um, but uh, one thing is adaption yeah. that everyone that's in, in professional sports need to succeed. And sort of Patrick adapted uh, he had a period of time when he got really tired of the work, uh, increased workload. But yeah. after a while, he adapted, and then we were on the plateau that we wanted to. Yeah. So it sort of raised one bar. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's that's probably one of the bigger issues I've ever run into with the triathlon community in general is – getting them to understand they send a team to they seem to understand kind of the the training that you need to do say maybe in the bike and the run even though it might be a little bit too much uh, but we can argue about that but then there's not a really great conceptualization of the amount of training that you need to do in the swim to be competitive no it's so different it's de yeah. it depends on what kind of relaxation you can put in yeah and simple simple physics because what we want to do you have your you have your trunk and you have arms and legs uh, basically in in uh, in distance uh, events the legs they don't want to drag you down they don't want to be something that uh, that uh, that uh, creates resistance leaks energy and then we have the arms and the arms need to pull the trunk as straightforward as possible and straightforward and you also want that constant speed yep you don't want like um speed and not speed speed yep. no speed so you want a constant because of the the laws of newton that uh, and yeah, the cost that, the cost of drag and, and coming back out of that trough. Yes, yes. So a lot of guys that they're kind of blocked by their their um, uh, heart rate monitors and uh, uh, they need to they need to get out of of uh, of sort of the 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 science in training and get back to like the physiological science of training and go to the physical science of yeah. training. So because uh, you, you want to minimize the energy. You can't eliminate energy, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but minimize. Yeah. And uh, in some cases, it's about optimizing the energy spent. Uh, but Firstly, we, we want to minimize the energy um, spent at a certain speed. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, if we, we kind of go to your book, you know, the, the interesting thing, the really cool thing about your book is that, you know, you, you, you put in all these little historical kind of little vignettes from swimming. Um, and, you know, the one that you talk about that I thought was really interesting was at the, you know, the U.S. had been pretty dominant in swimming um, in the early 1900s, um, had a really good Olympics. I think it was 1928. And then 1932 came around where it was in Los Angeles, and um, they thought they were going to be doing great again. And um, a Japanese swimmer had really kind of looked at how Johnny Weissmuller had, had been swimming um, and how dominant he had been. And uh, – they tried to improve upon the crawl stroke. And um, that's what they focused on in the lead up into the 32 games. And I guess maybe you can, you can talk about it a, a little bit more from there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
actually that that uh, swimmer uh, Takaishi, he was swimming. Uh, he was a swimmer uh, in 1928, yep. and he was uh, doing kind of a challenging. He challenged uh, Weissmuller for a while, but he ran out of gas. But uh, he was a shorter guy, shorter stature. Because Weissmuller um, was six two, six three, and yeah, which was enormous yeah. uh, at that time. Yeah. Uh, but that guy, he went home, and uh, right after his bronze medal back then, he started to coach other Japanese guys. Um, they started more cutting through the water instead of um, the Weissmuller hydroplane. Yep. Uh, so, uh, like, Weissmuller was, he was quoted with saying, my technique is perfect and my records are never going to be beaten. Yep. And that was exceptional um, psychological well, warfare, <laughs> wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It was so good because um, everyone knew that he was going to win because he had said so. And he was a big uh, media personality yeah. back, uh, back then. And then he got even more immediate personnel personality when he uh, he tra- tried out for Tarzan and he won the, the role the yeah. For, yeah yeah so I think yeah, a bunch of movies he was he might, might have been the we know like Michael Phelps is the most known swimmer yep yeah uh, during the last like 20 years yep um at that time, he might, he's not the most known uh, athlete, but he's like up there, top 10, yeah, maybe. Without a doubt. A, a good, yeah. uh, depending on where you are. But Johnny Weissmuller might have been the world's most famous man when all those Tarzan movies yeah. came out. Yeah. So that's on another level than athletes today. So, and so uh, 1932 yeah. Olympics happened and, and uh, the yeah, Japanese he, he, uh, the yeah. Japanese uh, cleaned everybody's clocks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Charleston went pro. So he, he was probably back there at, uh, since, since it was, uh, he was probably at the stands because uh, as a Tarzan, he probably lived in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. It was possible to go watch uh, the games. And um, young, short, exceptionally trained Japanese were really, really good. And they won everything except for uh, uh, on the back, on the man's side, which was won by Adolf Kiefer, American then. Yeah, that that, uh, has the, um, uh, started with a pace clock, I think, originally, the... The, the kefir pace clock. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, like, evolution wasn't, like, it, it wasn't standing still in the U.S. Yeah. But the guy who, who on the U.S. Olympic Committee, or what it was called back then, I don't remember, but uh, that guy, Thomas Hurston, he was doing, like, a, a little bit of essay on that. Kind said, of an analysis oh. of, yeah. Yeah, he, he tried to explain. And... He had four points of why the the they were better than the rest of the world, the, the Japanese, and none of them was technique. Yeah, yeah. I think it was uh, it was their mental attitude, um, their fitness because of their diet, and. Um, uh, a couple other things, but uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 but none of them were was that they were rotating along the long axis of their body. No, and then um, Alan Ford broke Weissmuller's record after the war, and he did it like Weissmuller style, so that like prolonged uh, what what, uh, what was happening uh, later on. Yep. And uh, I think yeah, swimming. Yeah, swimming is kind of interesting in that way that um, it it takes a while for new ways of doing things to 
to really permeate throughout the whole sport. Yeah, and one part of that is that uh, like we've had a lot of uh, evolutions with uh, the kicking on the backstroke and the yeah. kicking on the butterfly and kicking on freestyle now. Yeah. Uh, after the turns, um, uh, straight arm recovery and perfection of like kinetic movement it yep. takes a lot of time uh, for an individual. And it takes even more for kind of a kind of a population of swimmers to do it, which is what we need to do because uh, we like if. I would swim the perfect technique. Now, when I'm 46, I couldn't beat uh, Caleb Dressel. <laughs> no. I, 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 I couldn't beat Johnny uh, Weissmuller now. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, we need to attract the right people yeah. to this new method as well. Yeah, I uh, actually did... Um, uh, we had uh, the team that I work at sometimes... Uh, we had, uh, you know, Bob Gillett, you know, the coach. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So he, he coached Misty Hyman for a while. And, and he was actually one of the ones early on that was, um, you know, really working kind of the underwater uh, dolphin kick, underwater butterfly kick off the wall. And so we did like a whole, you know, two, two and a half day kind of workshop on all of his ideas around um, kind of the underwater dolphin kick. And that, you know, some wow. some of the best, you know, he pulled just like you do, um, where you talk about, you know, how animals uh, move through the water. Um, you know, he he put, he kept on bringing back over and over again, um, you know, the idea of how a fish kicks in the water um, on the underwater dolphin kick. And that, you and know, it's a lot. It's a lot of tail beat frequency. Yeah, it is. And it's um, but the other thing is, is that um the one thing that he always kind of stressed was this idea that, you know, you can make a bigger kick in the back if you're letting the top part of your body go with it, because then that can, that back is, is basically blocked. The, the front is blocking the back from um, kind of getting that, that frontal drag. Um, yes. So, yes. and that, that's, uh, the opposite of what you think yeah. at times, or what you teach at times. Yeah. You're going to be narrow, and you need to, to point straight forward. Yep. Uh, which is a good start, but uh, then it's, yeah. we also need to develop that a little. For, for a, it's kind of like there, there is a movie called uh, the Fifty Nine Chambers of Shaolin. Yep. Which. Uh, uh, it's, it's a Chinese movie, and it's about this guy who sees his family gets, uh, I think, he, he, it gets killed by by a vicious man, and he wants revenge. So he walks up to a monastery where Shaolin monks are created, uh, the, the Shaolin warriors. Yep. And like for the first five years. He, he is like in the garden growing vegetables uh, because he, he can't really, he knows somewhere there they're making the perfect warriors. But it's not like, it's, uh, it, 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 you're not supposed to ask that. Yeah. But after five years, he asks and uh, they say, we're not, uh, we're not uh, violent here. So then there's like five more years of growing vegetables and uh, stuff. Uh, but after 10 years, like he's um, getting into the first chamber, and that's like walking on, on the, uh, some logs in the water. And yep. When he's done with that, that's the next chamber where he's supposed to uh, be blindfolded and do stuff. Um, so it's 57 chambers, 37 chambers of Shaolin, and sort of when he's done with the 37th chamber, he's supposed to not want, uh, want, want uh, they, uh, when he's done, he's not, he's supposed to not want to have that revenge. <laughs> uh, so a li little bit like, uh, like that. Um, the first chamber, you might want to be just 
pointing. Yeah, in a very, the, very tight streamlined position. Yeah, very, yeah. very tight. But in like the fifth, seventh chamber, you can start moving a little bit. Yep. When you, uh, and then uh, also a thing with kicking is that we have uh, a really good kicker, uh, kind of a short guy. He's uh, 16 and uh, he's the fastest in the group when kicking. Yep. But swimming is a little bit slower compared to some other yep. same level. Uh, so he needs to kick. Use that. Kick as uh, close to 50 meters as, as uh, possible. And then the, the, the breakout. You can lose everything. Oh, you can lose all your momentum on the breakout. Yeah. 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 You yeah. can be really good at kicking and then the breakout will slow you down. So that's, um, that's also part of, of uh, a little later chamber. Yeah, so, it's all that, about that learning that mastery and that there's all those yeah, steps yeah. towards mastery. Yeah. Yeah. So as I say, like every 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 swimmer need to to to. Um, I get adults that coming to me and they say, "Yeah, I'm supposed to be uh, be rolling a lot because I read it in your book." Yeah. Yeah, but you're not on that level, and you're in yeah. you're in chamber one. Yeah. So then it's just starting to take ten strokes and trying to uh, have the right uh, joints in the hips and. Uh, no, they want to. They want to go from you know the the sofa to swimming three point eight kilometers um, in under an hour in in you know three months. Yes, yes, and and that's also a way people. Um, people from the sofa, they, they they want to they want to they want to do the same program as uh, uh, Lance Arms or Young Trudin or yeah. something. But yeah, it's it's not tailor made for you. Is it? If it's not tailor made for you, it's not good. Yeah, and and so I think that that kind of goes into um, another part of your book that I thought was really good, where um, you talk about kind of overtraining and. Um, you know, how overtraining was really not a familiar concept in the 1970s. Um, and it was that was around the point when, you know, like Mission Viejo started to really kick off in terms of, you know, swimming two, three times a day, um, you know, upping the yardage over, you know, 100,000 100, meters in a week, um, that sort of thing. So you want to talk a little bit about that and kind of what, and we talked about this earlier, that a lot of triathletes don't kind of have the greatest concept of the amount of training that goes in for swimming to swim well. Yeah, it's a, uh, as for triathlon, it's an extremely hard uh, to know what you're able to do. Uh, a lot of guys, they come in, uh, they come to me and they say, well, yeah, my, my goal is to, is to do an Ironman under 10 hours. And I try to say, that's not your goal. That's your vision. A goal is something you can measure. It's something you can validate. So goals would be uh, to, to, to swim four times a week, for example, um, to, to um, eat... Uh, have cheat eats on Saturdays only. Yep. You can, that's something you can monitor. Yep. But times, you can't monitor that. Firstly, you don't know if it's possible. You know that someone else has done it, but you don't know uh, if it's possible for you. So you could buy like, you, you could be like in the corner Um in a bad corner after a while if you're if you're like for for example in, in in work if you if you have a company and you want to do you want the guys to do um to create uh, 300 pieces of uh, junk every day yep and um, what if they What's the guys gonna do uh, at uh, two thirty if they already have three hundred pieces of junk? Yeah. 
They're not going to speed up, are they? No, it's it's Miller time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and uh, what if 300 times uh, pieces of junk is really impossible? So they can't do it if they like whole ass. What's that going to create? Yeah, a lot of discouragement. Yeah, yeah. So that that's what happens with your your uh, if you're putting up the wrong kind of uh, uh, of goal. Yeah. So a goal is to to follow kind of a training training regimen, and that's hard enough to to get the right level of training. And uh, secondly. If you measure only in results, might not be uh, telling you how good you succeeded with your training. Results in triathlon can be affected by a flat tire. Yeah, by the course, the conditions. Yeah, Uh, in swimming, it can be affected by uh, immune system, virus, a menstrual cycle, a lot of things that uh, that can uh, and then position in the, in the pack. So a lot of it, it, it's too complicated. So focus on what you're doing, uh, the goals. Uh, the, goal, the goal is something you can control. And the vision, you're free to have any vision. That's the level which you want to reach. So that's a bit. Uh, well, I thought I thought it was kind of interesting. You, um, you know, kind of sketched out some like training plans for people within your book. Um, you know, if you were going to swim one time a week, two times a week, or three times a week, and then talked about you know where you see kind of all the training going in terms of, you know, if we're talking about you know Mission Viejo in the nineteen seventies versus, um, you know, what some programs are doing now. So do you, you want to? talk about kind of some of the changes in training and some of the ideas around training and how they've changed over the years? Yeah, first I want to, yeah, you, you can say basically in the 60s you started, if, you, if you're going to do it just the same as a Sesame Street, in the 60s uh, the, the longer you swam, the better it was. So uh, Forbes Carlisle, he was like, yes, he was measuring progress he was an australian coach yes how much could you swim in 11 times two hours a week yeah so he started with uh, young teens and uh, uh, they they might have had like uh, 2.7 k per hour and uh, like Stephen Holland and the, the super, super guys, they could swim uh, almost 5K yeah. per hour. So that's the way, uh, 65 to 75. 75 uh, sort of periodization was a little more of a thing. So one day you swam a little harder and one day you swam long. Uh, so that, that started to like... Yeah, I was actually, I actually talked with, um, you know, uh, Don Schwartz, the coach? Yes, I heard his name. Um, yeah, he, he wrote a, he actually delivered a speech at a ASCA clinic in 1984, and it was called, um, I've got it right here. Uh, it was called um, Nonsense and the Beginner's Mind, Looking for a Quantum Leap. And it was all about kind of, uh, and I talked with him yesterday. I I did an interview with him yesterday. And, you know, he talked about um, what you're talking about right now in the 70s, where they went to, you know, one hard day, one easy day, one hard day, one easy day. And that was around the time he was coaching uh, Rick DeMont, who was the first uh, athlete to break uh, four minutes in the 400 free. Yeah. And uh, as you know, one of my favorite drills. uh uh, bears his name. So the demand drill is a, a single arm stroke drill yeah. with uh, with a passive arm at the side and breathing, close your breathing before you start to pull. So it's it's a really good good drill. Yeah. So I talked uh, to I talked to Rick Demont's coach the other day, and we we uh, you know talked about his his idea of a quantum leap. So um, yeah. So the the seventies was uh, hard day, easy day, hard day, easy day. Yeah. Yeah. And um, sort of. Uh, 
um, in the in the nine in the eighties they started some guys started a little more with heavy lifting. Yeah. Uh, like lifting up to them had been like lots of repetitions and yeah. uh, uh, like councilman was doing it and it, it sort of stabilized and saved his swimmers from, from shoulders. Yeah. Shoulder injuries. And then I but, guess, uh, and then you had uh, Dave Salo was just starting early eighties was just starting to write about kind of, race pace training in uh, swimming world yes, yes. And i think yeah, it was 82 yeah yeah, yeah. And, and sort of late late 80s uh, mental training had uh, a little bit of a breakthrough there yeah, and and i think even in well late 80s through the kind of mid 90s volume was still pretty high across the board for swimming yeah so listen to this this what happened a lot more during the 90s and uh, yeah, in the 21st centuries. Yep. More of filming. Yep. And more of technique work. Yeah. In a professional way. And when did they start filming Japanese? So, like, um, uh, so the, uh, the Western world or the, the, the top guys in swimming, they were like seven years after for really professional filming. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to get like, uh, to get it household. Like nowadays with an iPhone and a waterproof case or yep. a GoPro or uh, Olympus uh, Tough, you can get super pictures. A lot better than the Japanese had in, in like uh, the 1930s, but um, yeah, you know, and it's also interesting that that uh, like research and swimming has been so abundant. There's so many research articles on swimming. Yep. Uh, uh, mainly because it's because of a bunch of guys that did a good research mainly councilman and uh, yeah starting in the uh, 60s with yeah councilman yeah and uh horse sound of sweden and saltino sweden they did and, a lot of and i guys. saw you had you, you you posted a picture of kind of some of the the books that you're that you uh usually rely upon for for swimming yeah uh, yeah and i, 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 I have 300 books on, on swimming i try to get uh uh, yeah, it's cover various parts, but um, but I saw Councilman's uh, book was was still in your uh, in your top list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, no, it's uh, a great book. Was, yeah, I do have the, the original version of his first book. Yep. That was uh, the, and uh, I, I'm I'm really happy with how I, I showed the designer. Councilman's first book, Science of Swim Swimming, from 1968. Yep. And I, I have an original copy of that. Okay. And I showed him that, and wow, this is what I think is really, really beautiful. It's like a mix between like the dry uh, academics, really cool pictures, like pictograms. Yep. And uh, like a little bit of retro. And uh, Philip, who did this, uh, the design for my book, he like turned it in. He he, he filled out, uh, fill it out. He upgraded with. Uh, so it's a two-color book. So it's uh, not only black and white. It's a bit of blue, of course, if, since we're swimming in blue. Yep. And uh, yeah, and some color photos. So. No, it's a great book. Uh, yeah, it, it, it was uh, uh, nominated for some. Uh, it was nominated for two two prizes. One for contents in Sweden, uh, which uh, the the total concept of the book, and uh, also for a design. No, oh, fantastic! It's a, good, it's a great coffee table book. No, fantastic! Uh, uh, and uh, I th I think it's important to to not forget history. Oh no, without a doubt, and you can learn a lot uh, from all of these past coaches in terms of who they built upon and, and the, the progress that was made. And then you can, yeah. you know, and then you see where the, maybe some of the failures might've been 
and then yeah. you get to see kind of where the the next big leap might come from. Yeah, I think it's so hard to, to and I think it's not fair to reduce them to, to a theory. Yeah. Uh, Doc, Doc Councilman, Forbes Carlyle, they were they were more than uh, uh, than, than just um, theories of swimming. Uh, pros and cons, but uh, they were human beings. And they're swimmers as well. Well, I, I thought, you know, what was kind of interesting and one of those things that's always changing. And, uh, you know, you talk about kind of the optimal frequency for like, you know, stroke tempo for 50 freestyle or for a distance swimmer, for an open water swimmer. And, um, you know, you look at, uh, you know, men, it was the tempo kind of what's usually successful. It's a fairly narrow range of kind of about 1.2 to about 1.4. Um, but then you have kind of outliers like uh, uh, Ferry, Weirtman, um, yes. where, you know, he won gold at Rio. And, um, I mean, there were times where his tempo was 2, <laughs> two, yes, oh, two but one. Fer- Fer- Ferry is on and off. Yeah. Uh, I, I was uh, lucky to go to, to Japan with uh, Jeff, uh, invited by Justin Ari Harai. And uh, the, the Dutch team was there, and the uh, Swedish team, and uh, Australians were also. So I got to chat a little bit with um, with the ferry and also like he he's two tempos. One is just um, like he's he's usually you know how how a big open water race um, uh, we're, we're about uh, in the men's race it's about sixty to eighty guys. Yeah. And everyone, except for some, but like, if it's 80 guys, 60 can swim in a pack in half the race. Yeah. So it's kind of narrow. It's kind of crowded if if you have a narrow portal. to. to Yeah, and, and, you know, it's the, typically with the men, it's hard at the beginning, and then it it settles in, and then it's hard for the last thousand meters. Yes. So Terry, he doesn't like to be, be like he, he doesn't like a bar fight. Yeah. Like in the, so he, he's often like 25, 30 meters, maybe 50 meters behind the top, top guys. Yep. And then after a while, so he's like cruising, 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 because he's a really fast swimmer. He's like 40 and I think it's uh, 1440 or something. Short for, the, meters, like for the 1500, for the yeah. yeah. So, so he's cruising and then eventually he, he needs to, to start picking up. So he's doing those uh, like uh, little, little turbo. He's swinging like for 10, 10 strokes a little bit faster. Yep. Uh, and if he's gaining one row there so he's chilling for five minutes so then he gets back in the he gets back in the draft and slows everything down yeah, and yeah and, and then he's bum, bum, bum. so th- that's really interesting because uh, it suits him really good he, he started out like as kind of inexperienced in the union europeans and then him and marcy scout and they went and swam a lot of races and found out the optimum technique. Yeah, uh, t- for him. Tactic, tactics for yeah. a race. and for him. And, and that's a thing that a lot of the U.S. swimmers sort of, uh, I think that's, that's a boost they can get if they get more on the, on the, um, Lang Cup or the World Cup. Yeah, I mean, the U.S. kind of view of, I mean, amongst like the club swimming coaches, so, you know, the developmental age group kids, um, there really isn't a lot of enthusiasm um, for open water swimming, you know, because the, the coaches just kind of look at it as a distraction that takes them away from, you know, swimming in the pool and swimming at meets. And then there aren't a ton of um, events that the kids can go to yet at this point yeah yeah uh, but there, there is a great um, we have uh, John of the John of the Titans uh, we have uh, Ron Sam Pipers yeah. Mark Bernardino yep. it's a lot of competence uh, 
a lot of the know-how, but uh, but it, it's a big country. It's uh, like U.S. Uh, to travel in U.S. Actually, one of my best friends in the U.S. is John McCall in Rutgers University. is coaching there. Yep. Uh, he he. They live really close. Uh, the, the campus of Rutgers is really close to uh, to to Newark. So it's like, yeah, instead of going to Mesa for a Grand Prix, we can go to Stockholm for the Stockholm Open. Yeah. So, yeah, that was actually game. He, he was actually, the swimmers were all actually, they took less time off from work uh, in school. Yeah, yeah, going to, go, if, yeah. to go into Stockholm yeah. and go to Mesa. So that was... Uh, Kind of a new way to to view things. Uh, so, I, and not so many guys are like. They, I, I think like like Northwestern, yeah, uh, Notre Dame, yeah, uh, Michigan. They're close to Chicago. Yep, they have one uh, one way trips to like like one stop trips for Europe. Uh, so yeah, that that might be the next next time and next level of uh, college swimming uh, yeah because i guess nc2a is just uh um added it as an event open water swimming is that true yeah yeah they, i think it was about uh two years ago maybe three years ago yeah uh, that, that, yeah that's a college uh that's other association yeah they have it yeah uh, so it's not an ncaa but it's a it's a college uh, national championship. Yeah. Yes. So uh, Kansas. Yeah. That's pretty pretty fun. But but um, yeah, to get uh, um, yeah, NCAA swimming is fantastic. But uh, there is also a world outside of it that uh, um, the transition can be kind of hard. And it, but hopefully. And so double A swimming is uh, still strong after Corona. Yeah. Yeah. No, they haven't. Uh, I think I've only seen one program outright canceled since this whole thing started. So, um, but uh, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, over the next, uh, you know, 12 months as we yeah, kind of. I, I had uh, the opportunity to see like 15 pro programs on deck and uh, I've been tremendously host by the coaches and uh, but like for um, I talked to um, Andy Beggs in, in uh, Georgia yep uh, coach coach Beggs uh, he said like wow you're doing kind of cool trips uh, which is kind of hard for me because I'm coaching so much of that time when yep. uh, when uh, when they're when you're on your trips so, so yeah uh, but there's a lot of know-how in the United States. There's a lot of know-how in other... Oh, countries. in the rest of the world, without a doubt. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, very cool. Um, yeah, well, I think, uh, I think we kind of covered a lot of, uh, covered a lot of ground here. And, uh, do you have anything else you want to add? Oof. Um, <laughs> yeah, I... We've been working kind of with, with some kind of development program uh, plan in, in, on, a, on my team uh, and, my, uh, and on the Sw Swedish Women Federation and uh, how do we get strong? How, because in Sweden, my parents, they're like totally absorbed by the winter studio on TV. Mm -hmm. they work, uh, they're watching... Um, Cross country skiing, they're watching slalom, they're watching uh, biathlon. Uh, yeah. So, how do we do, how, how do we like construct the water studio? So, get a, have a wider appeal for people. Yes. Yeah. So, we need to work marketing, we need to work politics to get the, the, um, the facilities we want and the support that you need and the support. So yeah. I think that's the, the biggest part in Sweden in, in swimming, which we're not working enough in. We're super good at swimming in, uh, 
all over the world. Yep. I know very skilled coaches on the Maldives. They 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 only have their they only have the first uh, uh, like indoor uh, or twenty five meter square pool like last year. Okay. But they have pontoons and they have uh, like the pontoon sea pools and yeah. uh, they're very skilled in uh, and educated. Uh, but then it's then it's. Uh, um, and I know, know guys, uh, the coach in, in Africa and Ecuador, and they're doing good stuff. Uh, but they, we all need good um, opportunities from um, from uh, the local community. Without a doubt. Uh, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, Mikael, it was a pleasure. And, um, I'll put up some, uh, some links to some of the stuff you've worked on in the past and your book and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get, uh, get some more, uh, more people exposed to your ideas and, and really interesting book on, uh, open water swimming. Oh, uh, anyone who wants to talk swimming, uh, reach out. That, that sounds great. Well, thank you again. Thank you.